Their names right out of central casting with a group of mis misfits and malcontents right out of a, a Hollywood cast of characters. Their names like the Dapper Don, Little Sammy the Bull, the Yuppie Don, Phil the Pill Baroni Sr., Little Nicky Scarfo, the Gentle Don, Angelo Bruno. Carlo Gambino, the banker, Paul Castellano. You get where we're going with this. It's tonight we're married to the mob. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Angelo DeCipio. Welcome to the future of organized crime. Actually, welcome to wrestling with the future of organized crime with noted author George Anastasia. George, welcome to the show. Let me introduce my, uh, my cast of characters here. This is Dan the Man Sebastiano. The happy sure. haberdasher, my co-host. And he is uh, admittedly the smartest guy in the room. If you don't believe him, just ask. And the, uh, the fine, fine-looking young gentleman with the pompadour and white jacket, we call him affectionately the Granimal, Matthew J. Granahan. He is the, uh, the most Italian-Irish guy you'll ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> He'll tell you that a little bit later. So tonight, we're going to take a look at life in the mob. Why, George, and it's not something that's happened recently. It's, this is a long time. Why are we fascinated? We're, we're romanticized, this notion of the anti-hero, the, uh, uh, the, the Robin Hood, if you will. Right. Uh, even Al Capone was, uh, was beloved in his time. Now, but yeah. Why is that? I think partly, I think in, in modern times, it's because of the popularity of movies like The Godfather. But historically, Americans have always been fascinated with the outlaw, whether it's Billy the Kid, Jesse James, Bonnie and Clyde, John Dillinger. Uh, people that operated outside the norm seemed to be something that there was something attractive about them. It was one of those things where you didn't want to do that, but you, you could get off looking at them and thinking and reading about them and, and, you know, say, look at that guy. What's he doing? How's he do that? How's he get away with that? There's a fast, it's always been a fascination with that. It's an interesting thing. I, I did a little research and, uh, this notion of the anti-hero goes back to, you know, at least Robin Hood and, and beyond, quite frankly. Sure. Um, I first noticed in, in reading and doing some research for the show that even before Al Capone, this notion of the beloved mobster, the the benefic uh, the uh, the beneficiary to the neighborhood, to the, uh, the to the poor old lady, to the destitute family, you know, he's the guy that's got the money. You know, uh, that that whole notion started really um, here, as far as I know. But they tell me that. The formation of La Cosa Nostra, or this thing of ours, began somewhere around Palermo, Sicily. What do you know about that? Well, I mean, Cosa Nostra is, is, is basically the Sicilian Mafia, and then it was imported to the United States with the immigrant influx at the you know, turn of the last century. Um, let, me, let me just say one thing when we're talking about Cosa Nostra, because this is just something that gets under my skin. Um, yeah. Every time you see a... a, a a government report, it's La Cosa Nostra. And it's because the government loves three initials, FBI, ATF, DEA. The Italian is Cosa Nostra, our thing. Yes. La Cosa Nostra, literally trans translated as the our thing, makes no freaking sense. <laughs> and the, only the, the only reason there's La Cosa Nostra yeah, is because you're right, you're that's the way the FBI, right. yeah, the FBI wanted to describe it that way. Cosa Nostra is what it is, our thing. But that's a, that's a... That's just a pity. No, I mean, you know, George, that, that's really, I, you know, it's, it's funny how the simple things elude you. I had never thought about it. Dan the Man Sebastiano, yes, you sir. should have known better because you are the smartest <laughs> guy in the room. Or, or you've been telling me all these, all these months. It's, uh, you're up to bat, brother. You got George Anastasia, noted author, uh, mob well, historian. Go for it. Talk. 
I appreciate it. It was a pleasure meeting you. I, uh, when Angela told me you were going to be on the show, I had the chance to read a handful of your articles and some of your bio. Uh, I'm curious, before we get into the discussion of the mob, you you majored in French literature. How do you yeah. go from, from French literature to being the world's leading journalist on organized crime? What, how does that I transition ask you about? about? <laughs> See, I, I, I majored in French because when I went to college, I went to Dartmouth, which is up in New Hampshire. And this is you know the guys who wrote Animal House? They, they yes, were a couple yeah. of years ahead of me. So, I mean, that's what it was like, except it was not co-ed. So I had a chance to study abroad one semester, and I, I went to Montpellier, France. And when I went back to Hanover, I said, I'd like to go a second time. And the, the professor there said, the only way you can go a second time is if you major in French, because we only got one program. And if, we, if you go for another semester, it's got to be independent study. I said, all right, I'll major in French. So then I went and spent a semester in Toulouse. So I, that's how I ended up with a degree in French. And, you know, my parents, God love them. I was the first person in my family to go to college. And they just said, yeah, all right, whatever you want to do, do it. I mean, I, I had no idea what I was going to do with that. But that second semester I spent in France, three months in Toulouse, where I didn't have to take classes, I spent almost every day at a cafe drinking coffee and reading the International Herald Tribune. That's the way I connected with back home. Because back then there was no email, no internet, none of that. You know, this is a long ago. And that's when I was became fascinated with newspapers. So it's it's an indirect, that's how I got involved in the newspaper business. When I graduated, I wanted to be a reporter because of reading the International Herald Tribune. So yeah, French led me there. And then once I became a reporter, I you know, I was given different assignments. And in 1976, the Inquirer assigned me to cover the dawn of casino gambling in Atlantic City. So I was in Atlantic City when it all started. And part of the big debate back then was, is legalized gaming, you know, they always called it gaming, not gambling, is legalized gaming going to bring the mob to Atlantic City? Well, the answer was the mob already was in Atlantic City. So it became part of what I was covering. And then, (laughs) as as Angelo would know, in in 1980, Angelo Bruno's killed, and then the thing goes crazy, and I start to write more and more about the mob. So... That's how I became a mob writer. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, George, um, the mob in Atlantic City was was there for years with the not only the uh, the, the the restaurant and uh, hospitality industry, the five hundred club. Yeah, and but when the when the casinos came in, oh my God, the the explosion, uh, you know, the, the infamous, famous or infamous, George, depending on how you uh, want to address it, local local fifty four. In Atlantic City was a uh, the hotel and restaurant employees union uh, called H E R E, and boy were they here! Yes, they were. <laughs> well, they surely he, were. <laughs> no, Nick, Nicky Scarfo had his hooks into that union uh, from the dawn of casino gambling, and and eventually the federal government had to put a monitor in place and take it over. But yeah, they have a long history of being involved with the mob. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, oh and that's the answer to your question. It's a long answer, but that's. That's how I well, got no, it. I, yeah. I, I appreciate it. It's funny you mentioned the dawn of casino gambling. Like, is that going to bring the mob? The mob is part of the reason that casino gambling got through the state house as fast as it did. Oh, sure. I mean, every, everybody, sure. there were a lot of special interests, and that was one of the special interests. They, they saw the benefit that would come. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we also need to, to, to refresh people's uh, memory and their history. You know, long before... The casinos hit Atlantic City. You had uh, supper clubs, nightclubs in Atlantic City. The most famous being a place called the 500 Club, owned by a known racketeer named Skinny Amato. Yeah, Skinny Amato was a good friend of Frank Sinatra's. And if you talk to people from back in that day, the 500 Club, the Club Harlem, uh, there was illegal gambling in the back rooms of those places long before oh, the absolutely, place. George. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Atlantic absolutely. City is. George, Matt Granahan is chomping at the bit to ask you a shitload of questions. So, Matthew, go go for it, brother. You do that, and I'm actually going to change my shirt because I'm bleeding out in the background. (laughs) First of all, uh, I'd like to say, Angelo, and uh, um, your, your good buddy there, it's a pleasure to be back on the show, Dan the Man. I, and it's an honor to meet you, Mr. Mr. Anastasia. And I want to kind of tie this into, uh, I come from the world of, of combat sports. I uh, managed a number of UFC fighters and competed in MMA and, and did some pro wrestling. And you wrote a book called Gotti's Rules 
right. with a gentleman named uh, John Elite. Yes. And I've been friends for years with the Baroni family. I managed Phil Baroni, UFC fighter, pride fighter. Everybody knows Phil was a tough guy. But a lot of people may not know that prior to that, uh, Phil Baroni was also a notorious debt collector. And his father, Phil Sr., uh, and they say, you know, if you're going to be a gangster, you might as well have a badge. He was a gold star detective who was partners with uh, John Elite. Uh, and during his his tenure there in uh, organized crime. Uh, so there's always been kind of this, this thing when and I talked to Angelo about it with uh, combat sports and organized crime. You go back to the Godfather, the first Godfather movie. You had sure. Lenny Montana, uh, who was oh, sure. uh, playing Luca Brasi. And in addition to playing Luca Brasi, he was also uh, a real guy, you know, in that in that world. And you have guys like uh, up there with the Rizzutos up in Canada, like Gino Brito and uh, Dino Bravo, who was murdered up there. So there's always kind of been that that synergy, whether it was guys like uh, Vito LaGrasso and Phil Baroni, who were debt collectors, or guys that were deeper involved in, in, in organized crime. So that was kind of why I wanted to come on, especially yeah. being tight with the Baronis and you had having written that, that great book. No, I mean, there, there's an overlap there with, there's an interesting story about the Lenny Montana and the Godfather scene, where he's, you know, it's that famous scene where he's waiting to talk to the Godfather during the wedding. Uh, yeah, he's rehearsing his lines, yeah. Rehearsing his lines. Apparently, he was actually doing that. He was not an actor, but he was one of the one of the mob guys that was brought in, you know, they, they yeah. had to jump through a lot of hoops to make that happen. Well, yeah. he was sitting at a chair rehearsing his lines. True. And, Coppola saw it and started to film it and said, this is better than anything else we're going to do. Let, let's run with that. And that's what happened. It was, it was, it yeah. was an unscripted moment that and plays very well in that movie. Absolutely yeah. true. And what, what George is telling you is absolutely true. In the interest of full disclosure, Lenny Montana was a full-time professional wrestler. He was also a debt collector. He was straight up legit uh, right, right from the streets. He did two things in his life, beat people up for money and beat people up for entertainment. That's all he ever did. There you go. That's all he ever did. Now that I, uh, that I have a black shirt on and I'm not <laughs> bleeding through, <laughs> let's talk for a little bit about some of these, uh, uh, some of these characters. Um, sure. you know, Matthew mentioned John Elite. He's getting a lot of press here lately, uh, an awful lot of press. And some people say, unwarranted uh, unwarranted attention uh there are people who um who claim that as far back george as 1991 and even beyond that 1990 that john elite was a paid informant for the uh new york city detective bureau and, and or the fbi and or any no other a number of agencies uh, regarding law enforcement and uh, RICO enforcement. What can you tell us to your knowledge? Right. I know that you know John. I know that he's done some book tours with you and some television appearances. I don't know the man. I will tell you in the interest of full disclosure, I don't know him. I've never met him. Um, he seems like a pretty stand-up guy to me. But again, uh, a lot of these guys are, and you know, George, you've been around. A lot of these guys are real good about, uh, you know, playing the game. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, for a lot of guys, it's a matter of survival. Here's what I know about John. You know, I wrote I wrote a book about John called Gotti's Rules. John became a cooperator after he was arrested in Brazil and sitting in one of the most horrendous prisons in the world and came to believe that John Gotti Jr. and others up here in the States were giving him up. And he, just, he decided, what am I going to be a stand-up guy for when these guys are throwing me under the bus? In terms of, you know, and this is part of the room, There's the, the fascinating thing about the whole John Gotti Jr., John Elite relationship is they've been taking verbal shots at one another via social media since the trials. And, and it's amazing. In the old days, the shots wouldn't have been verbal. But today, it's, it's yeah. this, you know, the social media. Here's what else I know. John A. Light testified at two trials and was a government informant and a witness. 
Had he been involved as an informant prior to that, that would have come out because defense attorneys would have used that to discredit him. And, and the government would not have been able to hide any of that. So if there was any indication that that was the case, that he was an informer while he was out on the streets, it would have come out then. Um, I don't believe that. And I sat down and talked to John A. Light at length. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you, you've done quite a number of uh, you know, press junkets with him. Um, many of them televised. Uh, you know, one uh, that comes to mind, a very almost combative interview, quite frankly, George, that you did with Steve Adubato, um, a guy yeah, who was very familiar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that seemed. Can we talk about that interview for for a minute? Because I saw that interview, sure. and it seemed like he was deliberately. You know, Steve is not a guy that that will shy away from controversy. Right. But I've never known him to. And in the interest of full disclosure, I've known him for a bit, but I've never known him to push the, the you know the hot button yeah. issue like he did. During that interview, he really was pressing you guys. What now, was he I, looking for? No, I know, I know Steve, and I like Steve. I've been on the show a couple times. No, I think he, yeah. I think he was being an aggressive interviewer. You know, look at it. it John A. Light is a convicted murderer, extortionist, thug, drug dealer. So I think uh, you have to challenge him. I mean, I spent days and days and days sitting down in the diner talking to him. And I would challenge him as well about certain things. I think Steve was just doing what, you know, Steve didn't want to be giving this guy a pass. So he, so he threw some hard balls. And I think yeah. John, handled it, John handled it well. But you don't want to have a softball interview. You mean you want to have a serious conversation. Well, and there's sure. questions about what motivated John A. Light to do what he did. And was he always telling the truth? Matt's got a question over it. I see him raising his hand somewhere. I, I got my hand up because I, I did meet John, uh, John Elite only once. And this is an interesting story because you guys as fight fans will love this story. It was at Mohegan Sun Arena in, uh, up in upstate Connecticut. Connecticut. And uh, Phil was fighting. Uh, and I'm trying to remember who he beat that night. It was the night that I was in Phil's corner that night. But this was 2003. It was like 17 years ago, 2002, 2003. But it was the fight where Phil jumped up on the cage and he said, I'm the best ever. I'm the best ever. Phil's dad was there with a couple of guys, and Phil's dad looked like right at Phil Bruni Sr. looked like right out of central casting, as a, <laughs> what you think of a gangster. And um, and I met John John Elite with the at the after party, and I had no idea who he was, but they had had some kind of a meeting uh, there. They were there because because Phil Senior Phil, Phil's dad always was at all his fights, and I knew Phil's dad. And there was always a lot of rumors about Phil's dad. I knew what Phil had done as far as you know debt collecting. I knew guys that did that. But I didn't know how deep he was into it with with John Ali, and a lot of that's come out now with this book. You know, Phil's yeah. dad, Phil Senior, was actually uh, had to testify in the Gotti Junior trial. Right. And yeah. 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 George, that that's a great segue. That that Matthew just brings me into a great segue, talking about the, the fight game. You know, it's been long known, and I think it's it's no secret at 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 this point that uh, the mob has had their hand in boxing for decades, clearly for decades. Yeah. Um, what people don't know, or the general masses don't realize is that the, the mob has had their hand in professional wrestling as well for many, many years, um, largely as a way of laundering money to keep the, to make a dirty money clean. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the mob in sport, how it came to be, why it was, and to some degree is so lucrative. And I'm going to let Dan, the man, have at it with that subject matter. Go ahead, Dan. Sounds like a plan. Um, to Matthew's point, uh, I researched it while he was talking. Uh, the fight in Connecticut, he beat uh, Dave Meany in 18 Dave seconds. Manet, yeah, Dave Manet, yeah, yeah. yeah. Manny, yeah. yeah. Um, I, knew, I, thought, I knew it was Evan Tanner or Dave Manet. I, could, I couldn't think of what, but that was the one we jumped up on the cage. Yeah, That's why the best, I, why the best I, in the world. Know, remember. Yeah, yeah, best ever. Yeah. Well, to to get back to the sports question, Angelo uh, was bringing up. Obviously, the, the the organized crimes had its fingers in sports 
for years going back. I mean, ev- anywhere. And and it's, that's a global thing. You you hear stories of of uh, the Euro Cup and Central America with the Colombian uh, if influence in in football down there. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious if you have any insight as to how certain mainstream things started. Like Angelo mentioned, obviously, especially in the territory days, a lot of some of the smaller territories were used to launder. But there's been tie-ins to to major sports like boxing and soccer. Um, if you have any insight into how some of the more mainstream or larger uh, reported on incidents came about, like how, how does one go from say being a reputable sports promoter to being on the mob payroll? Where, what's the, what, how does that conversation go? Well, I mean, I think, I think that is just like any other business that gets involved with the mob. It's usually generated by either somebody has got to get a debt that they can't pay off. So they got to make a deal and cooperate with the mob or they're just greedy. I mean, you know, I've talked to enough guys who were involved in in sports betting and bookmaking. And by and large, they want an honest game because they're going to make money off a legitimate enterprise. And if, yeah. if, if a better thinks a game is fixed, then he's less likely to bet it. Right. So a lot of these bookmakers, they don't, they, don't, they don't want the kind of corruption. They don't want the Black Sox scandal where you're trying to fix the World Series. And, it, you know, they, they don't want to fix a Sonny Liston fight, which has happened in the past. Most oh, boy. Of, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, most of the guys that are legitimate bookmakers, they see gambling as I had a guy tell me this and it's fascinating. He said, you got to understand when you're talking to wise guys, vice is commerce. That's the way if you look at drugs, if you look at loan sharking, if you look at gambling, it's a business and it's about making money. And when it comes to sports, if the game's not only up and up, you're not going to have betters who are going to put the money out. It's, It's in their best interest for sports to be on the up and up. Now, occasionally there have been stuff that's been done fixed games and somebody's looking for a big payoff, but by and large, they want it to be an honest game. I see well, me. George, you, you brought me right into a beautiful subject right. Two two uh, ends of the spectrum, a guy who aggressively pursued finance and a guy who wanted to keep things the way they were, keep the status quo. Let's talk about the two Dons, one, uh, the, the dapper Don, you're laughing. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, don't you, brother? Go ahead. Okay. The dapper Don John Gotti in New York and a, a gentle young man from Philadelphia. In fact, his photo is behind me. A guy named uh, Angelo Bruno. Right. Two different approaches to business. Let's talk about how each of these Dons did business in their particular cities. And then I have a follow-up question regarding... Who's behind the throne? Yeah. I mean, I think the simplest way to explain Angelo Bruno and and most of the mob bosses back in his era, which was the the 50s, the 60s, 70s, the idea was to make money, not headlines. Don't call attention to yourself. Nobody needs to know me. I'm I'm doing about my business and I do it in the shadows. John Gotti changed the whole dynamic. He became America's celebrity gangster. Oh, boy. The best known since Al Capone. And, you know, he's on the cover. Yeah, on the cover of Time magazine. Well, exactly. you could argue that if you're running a secret society and you want to stay in the shadows, that's not the way to comport yourself. Uh, yeah. And that's, I think that explains, I think, why if you look at Angelo Bruno was a boss for 21 years. John Gotti's run lasted from 1985 to 1992. I mean, yeah. it ended in 1990 when he was arrested. So th- there's the difference. Um, we should also point out that, that- uh, this is not the first time. He's not the first guy to uh, to to have that grandiosity about him. There was a guy before John Gotti, um, a very flamboyant character named Joe Colombo, right? Who threw parades yeah. and had uh, yeah, the Italian American Civil Rights League. Exactly, Colombo, the Italian American Civil Rights League. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and he was uh, a guy that loved the camera and mic in his face. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you, to your point, they don't like that kind of attention. Well, that's why I you think know? that's why Joe Colombo was gunned down a year after he started the Italian American Civil Rights League. And yeah, he was gunned down exactly. on the orders of the other bosses in New York because this is not how we operate. Why are you doing this? You know? Well, and in that vein, there was a young guy in Philadelphia. And I mean, young, literally young, uh, who went by the moniker Skinny Joey, Joseph Merlino. 
Oh, you know, yeah, absolutely. Um, who, in the interest of full disclosure, as a waiter, I served him a few times at the old Philadelphia Spectrum. Yeah. When he would come into the Ovations Club. And no. he had a nickname for me, George. He used to call me Bowtie. Because <laughs> we had to wear these burgundy bow ties. <laughs> but Joe, Joe he's the guy... Thing. Yeah, but you you know where I'm going with this because he's he's one of our uh, you know in the interest of full disclosure, Joseph Merlino is a purported I have to say this legally he is a purported member of organized crime in Philadelphia, um, allegedly uh, that he uh, he's a guy who also did you know quite frankly a a, a, a lot of public service for the community. Through Christmas parties for disabled children, he gave you know old people money. He's a guy that, you know, I mean, you know, Channel Six and Channel Ten here in Philadelphia loved him for a long time. I, I mean, the the Robin Hood analogy is a good one. I mean, Joey, at least his persona was a Robin Hood esque kind of persona. He was out on the streets, Christmas parties for the kids, giving away yeah. turkeys at Thanksgiving, those kind of things. Now. <laughs> You, you know, I remember specifically covering these events for the Inquirer and talking to the FBI agents, and and their their take on this was, well, yeah, it's easy to be generous when it's not your money. He's out there robbing and pillaging, <laughs> using some of it to, to to you know to create this image. Joe is a fascinating guy. I've talked to Joey a lot. He's he's an interesting guy, but in a lot of ways, Joey is the John Gotti of Pashunk Avenue. You know, more more high profile. Again, I have to I have to preface this by saying, in the interest of full disclosure, I grew up in in South Philadelphia. I grew up at uh, Broad and McKean St. Agnes Hospital, right. between Fifteenth and Sixteenth on McKean Street. I know Pashunka Avenue very well. Uh, some of my old stomping grounds were, you know, Villa de Riti and places like that. That I don't know if they're even still around <laughs> anymore. But, uh, you know, again, I have to preface this, George, by saying in the interest of full disclosure, because I was a mere child at the time that names like uh, Phil Leonetti and uh, Sal Testa and Chicken Man Testa were being bantered about uh, Nicodemo, little Nicky Scarfo. Daniel, what the hell are you laughing at? Now, if I may, real yeah. quick, you brought Interject up a handful away, of... my friend. Interject you, away. You brought up a handful of uh, nicknames. I, I'm, as Wait an a Italian, minute. My Daniel, it gets better. Hold on. Oh, no, I know it does. That's that was, that was what I'm leading to. As an Italian myself, everybody... I mean, you have a, a family reunion with 50 people. 47 of them have nicknames. I'm curious how many... Of these, in your knowledge, experience, how many of these nicknames that some of these guys had came from the family and the friends and existed, and how many of them were from the press? George, it's a good question, George. <laughs> Absolutely, Dan. It's a very good point, and I agree with you. I mean, I have relatives who had nicknames. They weren't gangsters. That They were from downtown. I mean, you got 18 guys named Tony. Well, what are you going to do? Fat Tony, Little Tony, Short Tony, Big Tony. <laughs> I had nothing to do with the mob. And I think a lot of these guys, I mean, Little Nicky, was called Little Nicky, not to his face, but he's called Little Nicky because he didn't, it wasn't, stature-wise, wasn't yeah. very good. I mean, that, that's, so a lot of it is just, it's a South Philly neighborhood kind of thing, not a gangster. Yeah. Thing. I had an It uncle. really is, George. It really, really is. Matthew, you and I come from the world of combat sports, pro wrestling, where character is everything. Well, I got some names, uh, uh, and we're going to go through some of these names with George. Of course, a couple of them we already went through. The Dapper Don, Sammy the Bull, the Yuppie Don, Michael Franchise, Phil the Pilbaroni, Little Nicky Scarfo, the Gentle Don, Angelo Bruno, Carlo the Beak Gambino, the Banker, Paul Castellano, the Driver, John Stanfa, Phil Chicken Man Testa, Handsome Salvi Testa, Johnny Cuball Calabrese, Skinny Joey Merlino, Philip the Lionheart Leonetti, Vinny the Chin Giganti, <laughs> Dominic the Bulldog Cantorino, and my favorite, Frankie Flowers D'Alfonso. Yeah, well, I mean, here, Frankie Flowers on the florist shop. That's why it's called Frankie Flowers. Oh, Giganti, yeah. Giganti was called the Chin, depending on a couple different stories. One, he was called the Chin because 
it was the Vincenzo, and it, it became a derivative of Vincenzo. The other was, in his early days, he was a boxer, and he had a, a glass jaw, and so they yeah. called him the chin. But here, That's the story here's I heard, the, George. Here's the, one of the interesting spinoffs of that. Giganti was the boss of the Genovese crime family, one of the most powerful families in New York. And there was an edict when he was the boss that you could never mention his name because he was worried about wiretaps and, and listening devices. So when any member of his family was having a discussion with another member and they would say, this guy says we can't do that, and they would rub their chin. If you're listening on a wiretap, you have no clue who they're talking about. I mean, so, exactly. you know, these, these nicknames can play a lot of different roles. And in this case, George, used it we've as, got a phone call coming in. Yeah, go ahead. Caller, are you there? Yes, I am. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, caller. Who am I speaking uh, to? My name, my name is Mike. Hey, and, Mike. Uh, Welcome to George Anastasia. Dan the man, Matthew Granahan. I'm Angelo. Welcome to the show. You got a question for George? Thank you. Yes. Uh, my question is this, George. It's said in uh, the mob that when you get sent for, if you're going to be clipped, it's usually your best friend that does it. Now, uh, the gentleman Frank Sheeran, also known as the Irishman, right. who was very close friends uh, with Jimmy Hoffa. From what I understand, he was the closest friend to Jimmy Hoffa. In a deathbed confession, uh, Frank Sheeran, also known as the Irishman, uh, confessed to being the one who clipped Jimmy Hoffa. I want to know what your feelings on that are. Yeah, here's, there's been a lot written about this. I, I don't believe Sheeran did it. I believe Sheeran was there, just as you said. I think Sheeran was there to make Hoffa comfortable to come to the meeting. But I don't believe Sheeran was the hitman. And if, if, you, if you look at the history of Sheeran, I mean, he originally told stories where he wasn't the hitman trying to get a book deal, and then he couldn't get a book deal. And then when he said, oh, yeah, by the way, I was the hitman, then he got the book deal. There's, there's Paul, what are your thoughts on that? On what? Um... Well, it's it's uh, well. From what I understand, when he first made had first contact with Jimmy Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa asked him, uh, "I hear you paint houses," which is a term, uh, which is pretty much self-explanatory if you think about it. Uh, and let, let me interrupt you for a second. Here's another thing about that. It, I, I've been involved in this for thirty, thirty-five years. I've talked to a lot of law enforcement people. Have been involved in it for. They have never heard that expression ever. Uh, yeah, you know, okay. I, you about that, say, I, heard never... some, I heard you do work. I heard you did some work. Uh, you know, I, I heard you're a guy who can be dependent on. I've never heard the expression, I heard you paint houses to indicate somebody committed the murder. Um, I, I, right. I, heard, I never heard that term, George. I've heard the term carpenter used a time or two. Yeah, doing work. Doing work yes. is usually the expression. Exactly. Now, now, George, I have one other quick question for you, if you don't mind. Take your time, um, for sure. Uh, my father, um, I, I know it sounds funny. My father knew a guy <laughs> who was in the masonry. Who was in the masonry business? I can't remember the guy's name. His father, this guy, this mason's father, was in the mob, and there was a book, one of the many books that were written. But in this one book, there was a chapter called, and it was about this guy's father, called Honor Thy Father. Does that ring a bell with you at all? No, I mean, I think there was a book, Honor Thy Father, an entire book, but I think that was about Joe Bonanno. So, no, oh, I'm, yeah, not, I'm not familiar yeah. with what you're re, re, uh, referring to here, no. Okay, I, I was just a cor just curiosity. This was another <laughs> there were a lot of guys involved in, yeah. I have a good segue for you. Matt, yeah. Matt hey, wants to chime in there. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Sure. I got a, I got a good segue for you. Um, yes, so sir. You talked about the, the Sheeran and the Irishman, and you talk about all these nicknames. There's another nickname of a guy from my era, MMA, the Iceman, Chuck Liddell. The Iceman oh, sure. also, the Iceman Kuklinski also claimed that he killed Hoffa. So there's yeah, been right. a number of people point. Yeah. 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 Another word, Angelo, there's another word in pro wrestling. It's called heat. Yeah. But in, in the world that Mr. Anastasia reports on, heat means something different. And Absolutely. I come from Seattle, <laughs> and 
I'm going to kind of make this point. I come from Connecticut. Now, all my information I know is that I've been out of Connecticut for almost 20 years. But in Connecticut and Rhode Island, they never wanted heat. They never had nicknames. And they used to make fun of people in New York. You know what they used to call them when the Sopranos came out? They used to call them Gavones. Yeah. yeah. They paid a lot of attention to yeah. them. So. Yeah. Well, Chloe, well, it, thank well, you so much. They, 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 they either call them uh, Gavones or Sfacino. There's a word I haven't heard in a while. Exactly. Well, Paul, you know what, Dan? I'm I'm sorry, you guys, but you have to forgive me a minute because I'm listening to this caller, and it just dawned on me. He he sounds like somebody I know. I was going to say it's going to take you a while to figure out who this is. Is it? I was. No, no, that no, that that ain't me. That's a myth. (laughs) Your your name's Mike. Oh my God! All right, hold on, hold on. Is this Mike Murphy? Yes, it is. Oh my God! Oh, You're losing it. <laughs> the, the, the guy on the phone is Michael Murphy. He's a professional wrestler from Philadelphia, uh, living. Uh, I think he's in an undisclosed location now in Lansdale, PA, somewhere. Uh, well, it was undisclosed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's been a long time. I almost didn't recognize your voice, man. I haven't heard from you in a long time, brother. Oh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, getting old, fat, and gray. That's what wrestlers do. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm doing good, and I wanted to wanted to call in and see if I could slip one by you. Yeah, and, well, uh, I'm glad you did. Well, now that you called, dude, when when the hell are you going to come back on the show? Uh, hopefully very soon. Unfortunately, uh, when we had that hurricane that came through, unfortunately, my apartment ended up having like, uh, three feet of water in it oh, my God. and, and yeah. a lot of my electronics, uh, a lot of my electronics got destroyed and yeah. I'm in the process of working as much overtime as I can to, you know, replace what was lost. I hear um, you, yeah, but no, uh, the one thing, uh, the gentleman, from Connecticut brought up. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch his name. That's Matt. Matt, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, you were right. I, you know, now that I think about it, George Kuklinski, the Iceman, uh, I would have to say if it came down to a choice between the Irishman or the Iceman, I think it would be the uh, the Iceman yeah, if it was going to be anybody that was going to clip off of. <laughs> Well, I tell you, Mikey, thanks for calling, brother. I'll give you a holler when we get off the air, all right? All right. You guys take care. Have a good night. Take care. Good night, Mike. God bless. You, That's you slip, you funny. Slip. It was Mike Murphy, that little fucker. You're, oh, you're, pardon you're, my you're, you're pardon slipping my on us. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you what. This is a great spot, Dan. Why don't we go ahead and do a word from our sponsor? Okay. Um, and then and talk to everybody about our sponsor, and then we'll get back and bring George back for part two of our conversation. Sounds good. Yeah. Obviously, this week's show is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped.com for uh, all your manscaping needs. It's funny. We have a mafia show, you know, the, the story of taking care of your boys. Well, with Manscaped.com, you can take care of the two most important boys in any man's life, and that's you your, your best friends, and uh, they have the greatest trimming service. You can use promo code WRESTLINGFUTURE for 20% off your purchase at Manscaped.com, Lawnmower 3.0, Manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. There you go. And so will we. We're probably the only show regionally, George, that has a ball grooming kit for us. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? They love us and we love them. Yeah. There you All go. right, let's get back to some of these names. Um, let's talk about, you know, we, we can have fun with these names, but behind these names, George, are some, some heavy hitters some some real serious business. Um, Back in the the early late seventies, early eighties, there was one hellacious mob war going on in Philadelphia that, in some regard, spilled over to New York. I, I mentioned before the commercial break that I wanted to find out who's behind the throne. Does New York still, as a uh, a mob enclave? 
uh, dictate policy, if you want to use that term, do they dictate policy still to the uh, underling mobs like Philadelphia, uh, Miami, Chicago? What What is the power structure? I mean, again, this is stuff I know from talking to guys, and none of it is etched in stone. I mean, this stuff, you know, they don't put out annual reports, so you don't really know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... I mean, New York has always had an influence in Philadelphia. When Angelo Bruno was the boss, he was a very good friend with Carlo Gambino, and consequently, the Gambino family had a lot of influence down here. Yeah. When Scarpo became the boss, his connections went through Bobby Manna and the Genovese crime family, so they had a lot of influence down here. Yeah. Joey Merlino has been friends with guys in the Lucchese crime family. Now, it's not so much that the New York families control what's going on down here, but they offer support to whoever's in, in a position of power. The other thing is, given what's happened in Philadelphia in the, since Bruno's death in terms of the number of informants and guys that have flipped, guys in New York are a little bit leery about coming into Philadelphia because they don't know yeah. who they can trust. So there's a lot of different dynamics at play. Then when you factor in Atlantic City as well and, yeah. and the, the benefits that are there if you can get your hooks into Atlantic City. So New York has an interest in what's going on yeah. down here. But I think it's an ebb and flow depending on Who's connected to who? And it's not so much they're dictating what's going to happen. Well, I'm going to move out of the way for just a second. I want to talk about some of these characters behind me here, George. Right. Um, I see Salvi Testa right there. Yeah, Sal Testa. Explain to everybody who Sal Testa and uh, Philip Chicken Man Testa were. Yeah, Angelo Bruno's underboss was Philip Chicken Man Testa. He got the nickname because his family had been in the poultry business. Now, after Bruno gets killed... Phil Testa becomes the boss. And Salvi Testa is young, handsome, charismatic guys like the crown prince of Philadelphia. Testa, Phil Testa is killed within a year of Bruno's murder. So now Scarfo becomes the boss. And Scarfo was closely, closely aligned with Phil Testa. In fact, a lot of people believe Phil Testa was Scarfo's mentor and brought him into a position of power. Right. Scarfo's in power for only two or three years, and he starts to see Salvi Testa as a rival. Uh, Salvi is and very George, proud. can I stop you there for a second? Th those two or three years that little Nicky Scarfo took over Philadelphia, right? It 84. is said were among the bloodiest in uh, Philadelphia mob history. Yeah, Angelo, you're right about that. I used to know the numbers. I'm trying to think now. During Scarfo's reign, I think there were 20 to 25 murders. Scarfo was indicted with another 20 guys. And this was a family that only had about 60 or 70 members. So think about it. 20 to 25 are dead. 20 yeah. to 25 are under indictment. Basically, you've decimated the crime family. And Salvi Testa was murdered on Scarfo's orders. Salvi Testa's murder came in the middle of that all that violence that you're talking about. And yeah. Salvi Testa's murder sent a signal to everybody in the organization. If Scarfo can kill Salvi Testa after all that Testa's father did for him, then yeah. Scarfo can kill anybody. And that undermines it, Scarf Resolution. Yeah, and it should be pointed out that they found his body, I believe, George, at the Philadelphia airport. No, or, uh, no Salvi was dumped on the side of a road in Gloucester Township over here in Jersey. Okay, well, where did the uh, the, the notion that he was, uh, they found his body near the airport in Philadelphia? No, there were a couple other bodies dumped out there, but I, I know the Salvi story. Salvi was wrapped in a rug and... And uh, he was killed on Passion so, Gavin with a candy oh, store. Oh, so he was uh, found here in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah, they, I think it was Gloucester Township. I had in a alone in a dirt road. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, yeah. The, uh, the, other, uh, the other test is his father, of course, right. uh, Phil Chicken Man. And I had the chance to meet him once uh, for no particular reason other than I just I met him. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a distinguished gentleman because he had... A face full of pock marks. Right. Yeah. He had really, really bad skin. Yeah. Really bad skin. Um, here we go. Take my yeah, he, he was There's well a photo behind me, uh, George. Uh, you'll see uh it it's a, a picture of Paul Castellano uh after, after post life, oh. afterlife. Um, interestingly enough that the photo of Paul and I put these two photos side by side. You can do it if you want to. If you want to check it out, they are almost identical between his photo and Angelo Bruno's uh, assassination photo. Right, they're they almost identical. Yeah. 
Castellano was killed out in front of Spark Steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. Angelo Bruno was killed uh, in front of his own house at Tenth and Snyder. But yeah, yeah. there's the same kind of photo where they're they're back with their mouths open, just lying there. It's very brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Go ahead. Um, a couple of the guys here um, that I want to mention real quick because I know Dan's got a, uh, some questions. Well, um, I was actually pointing out that looks like Matt had something to say. He's been oh, raising, okay. he was raising his I hand. I don't want to interrupt the flow, your your flow, but I, I had a more of a, of a question, different kind of question for for Mr. Anastasia. Again, you know, I haven't been I haven't been up north in, in a long time, but how much are is organized crime being affected by the online gambling and also the coronavirus? Oh, all, good question. Two good questions. I mean, good I mean, question. I mean, that was devastating, and also you think you think for loan sharking too. Yeah, I mean, uh, online, the mob has gotten its hooks into some of the online operations, especially offshore stuff. So there's been cases where guys have been running major operations offshore using online. The, the, the virus, that's an interesting point, and, and people miss this point. You know, sports betting is built around athletic events. If you don't have games being played, then you got nothing to bet on. Yeah. And, and they've taken a hit through the, you know, this where we are and and people are wondering whether the football season is in fact going to happen we're already seeing college uh leagues canceling some some uh, colleges are not going to play and and I'm wondering if we can get through a a 16 game NFL season I don't see how we can if this virus is, is as rampant as it appears to be on so the college, other hand george it's yeah but on, on the other I, hand george uh yeah. while they're taking a hit regarding sports betting and and athletics they're making a killing literally and figuratively, figuratively uh, in, uh, in the drug market. Well, they're they're, that's always they're the making a fortune in you know, illicit drugs. Uh, that's between, always, yeah. That, yeah, that's I mean, the case it, it's, it's, these it's, are times that are, you know, hard for people and trying for people. And, uh, you know, people are, they're not just drinking anymore. They're shooting up. They're, they're. They're doing coke, uh, heroin, you know, all Angela, kinds of things. Angela, I would almost kind of think the opposite because here's what I'm thinking, finding, you know, just from a business perspective, look, you've got all these people that are that were drawing large amounts of unemployment that weren't working, and there was no gambling. Where loan sharking comes from is degenerate gamblers. So if you don't have degenerate gamblers and, and you got these guys that are getting this influx of cash and they got to stay home, right? And these, yeah. and it's also guys that are running around blowing money. Let's face it, on blowing hookers. Oh no, you're home. absolutely right, Matt. The point, the point I was yeah. making is that those individuals, you know, who cannot, for, you know, for obvious reasons, who cannot bet on sports uh, or athletics, you know, people that are struggling, you know, you know, Mister and Mrs. Uh, you know, America every day that are struggling, you know, to make ends meet. You know, beer, you know, beer and wine isn't doing it for them anymore. They're smoking dope. They're, you know, they're blowing coke up their nose. They're, they're shooting up heroin. They're doing all kinds of nasty stuff. And the mob has never left that business, Matt. They well, never ask, left the drug business. Let me ask this to, to, Ms., uh, to uh, Mr. Anastasia, because, you know, historically, you know, and it's, and it's not, it, even with the Gottis, it wasn't true. But they weren't supposed to deal drugs, but a lot of guys did. But what I want to ask you is that the heroin industry and that whole thing that happened years ago, like with the French Connection, uh, is that still going on as far as is, is the mob still involved in heroin? I think the mob is involved in all kinds of drugs. I mean, and, and Angelo makes a good point. It's not, you know, a lot of these guys, the rulers don't deal drugs. But it's not because they're morally opposed to drugs. A lot of the mob bosses don't need the aggravation that comes with That's drug true. dealing. And they yeah. already got more money than they need. But the, the guys out on the streets that are hustling, it's a way to make money. They're going to jump right at the opportunity no matter what. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, that was one of the reasons, George, quite frankly, that that Angelo Bruno was killed. He didn't want, you know, he didn't want that stuff. It and kind of reminds me of that scene from The Godfather yeah. where... You know, where Marlon Brando says, you know, well, keep it in those in, in a quote unquote, those neighborhoods, you know, meaning, you know, the, the minority neighborhoods, you know, but he didn't want to deal with with the drug thing at all. 
And let me let me tell you a story about that, Angelo, because this is this comes up all the time. People said Angelo Bruno, Angelo Bruno was opposed to dealing drugs. And I think he was. But here's here's what happened the year before he was killed. OK. Angelo Bruno's consigliere is a guy named Antonio Tony Bananas Caponegro. He's based in Newark. Yeah. And he's he's dealing heroin on the side. He's sneaking because he's not allowed. That same year, 1979. Carlo Gambino's two distant cousins from Sicily, Rosario and Giuseppe Gambino, come down to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and they open Valentino's, a high-end supper club, right near the In the interest of full disclosure, George, (laughs) I was the DJ there. Okay, so, (laughs) Angelo Bruno welcomes Rosario and Giuseppe Gambino into South Jersey, into his empire, with an introduction from Carlo Gambino. Rosario and Giuseppe Gambino are part of the infamous Sicilian pizza connection. They're dealing big, big time heroin. And people within Bruno's organization knew that if Rosario and Giuseppe Gambino are in Cherry Hill, they're paying tribute to Angelo Bruno. So when they give Bruno an envelope full of cash, that's drug money. Bruno's taking that money, but saying don't deal drugs. And Caponegro and those guys came to see Bruno as a hypocrite. And a lot of people believe Caponegro was the guy who shot Bruno. And he he himself was double crossed by the New York guys, but Caponegro thought he had the okay. And the reason he was going to eliminate Bruno was this whole issue over the drugs. Where was the notion then, George, that that somehow John Stan for the driver was involved in the hit? I think he was. He 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 consistently denies that, but it was it was Tony Bananas, Caponegro, Frankie Keys de Simone, Frankie right. Sindone, uh Stanford was the driver, and Stanford wasn't supposed to be the driver that night, but he was. Well, now let's talk about that. All of a sudden, his regular driver gets pulled, and there's this other guy comes in. And and incidentally, by the way, I don't know, you can draw your own conclusion, but very shortly after this, John Stanford becomes the boss. Well, not very. Are you fucking kidding me? And Stanford. Stanford went on a run after this because Caponegro, Sindone, uh, uh, they all turned up dead. All the guys that were suspected of being involved in the Bruno murder turned up dead, except yeah. Stanford. He went on the run. And he's found about a year and a half later working at a pizzeria in Maryland controlled by the Gambinos. He'd already been convicted in abstentia of perjury. So he comes back and goes right into federal prison. And for seven or eight years, that whole bloody scarf era, Stanford sits it out in jail. Now he comes out of jail in 1989 and basically he's supposed to go back to Sicily. But some guys in New York say, John, stay down in Philly and put it back together. It's a mess down there. Yeah. All the murders. So that's how Stanford becomes the boss. And then you've got the conflict between Stanford and the older guys versus Merlino and the younger guys. That's the way that played out. Yeah. Matthew, I'm going to go to you and then we're going to throw it to Dan. Okay, I was Matt. just going to say, just wanted to reiterate what I said before. It's kind of funny. Because you know all these names and all these nicknames, and the whole idea, you know, again goes back to I think New England thing, Rhode Island. You're not supposed to know people's names, you know, and, and it's so funny because you're. It, it's like, and it's almost like like when the, the, the Sopranos came out, <laughs> came like, exactly. and and, and we're, you know where I was from, we made fun of that because it was you know it, you, that's why guys started rolling. You well, that, Matt, you're absolutely right about that. It's the more sophisticated guys didn't want any of that kind of stuff. They realized that there's, there's no benefit in any of that. George, you know what? Matthew just brought up one hell of a point. He brought up a hell of a point, and Dan and I actually talked about this privately. The notion that I know a couple of people who have talked about this publicly who said that the Godfather was the most unrealistic mob film they've ever seen to The Sopranos was spot on. Let's talk about how the mobs represented in film and television. Dan, have at it, brother. Well, but before we get to that, I was hoping actually to, to, to roll back to something you had mentioned a minute ago. Um, you were telling the story, and you used a word that pops up a lot in mob fiction, in the drama, in the dramatizations, and everything. Is the the role of a consigliere? Could you maybe uh, expand sure. on what that actually is versus the fact that most people know it from Hollywood? Yeah, I mean the the structure of of a traditional mafia family. There's a boss, 
an underboss, a consigliere, then the capos, the soldiers, and the associates. Consigliere is usually a guy who has been around, he's, he's got experience, and he's called upon to settle disputes. He's a counselor. Consigliere is Italian for counselor or lawyer. So, I mean, the boss, the underboss, and the consigliere form the kind of the the triumvirate that runs the organization. And the counselor would be a guy who, if there's a dispute between capos or a soldier and a capo, you have a sit down and you work that out. And that's, yeah. that's what the consigliere was. And that's what Tony Bananas was in, he was based in Newark. But yeah. Angela brings up a good point about movies. I mean, the most fun, I've written a lot of books. The most fun I had, I wrote a book with Glenn Mack now called The Ultimate Book of Gangster Movies, where we basically did, we listed the top, the best 100 gangster movies ever. We wrote essays about each one. And Godfather 1 and 2, cinematically, are probably the best. But realistically, the two best, I think, are Goodfellas and Donnie Brasco. Let me throw a name at you, George. Because I know that you're a film buff as I am. There's a couple of movies and so, that star a couple of my favorite actors. And if you grow up watching gangster films like I did, you, you, you cannot unlike James Cagney and John Garfield. Right. Let's talk about one of my favorite movies. They made me a criminal. Okay. That one. And let's talk about the realistic or unrealistic nature of a film like White Heat yeah. with Cagney. Well, you know, I mean, that's one example, White Heat, uh, Top of the World, Ma. Warner Brothers in the 1930s tapped into that, and, and that became their genre. You know, it was before Cowboys and Westerns. There were a lot of gangster movies back then. Uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson was another guy who played a lot of gangster movies. Bogart started. Oh, God, sure. So all, yeah, all Little Caesar. Movies. Yeah, Little Caesar. I mean, uh, you know, those kind of things. Scarface with Paul Mooney. I mean, it, and, and we did some research when we wrote the book. It, the interesting thing, Scarface, the original Scarface with Paul Mooney, they had to have a disclaimer. They had a subtitle, I think, Scarface, The Shame of the Nation. And um, when they remade Scarface, and, and, and they had censorship. And, you know, at one point, at the end of Little Caesar, I think the guy says, mother of... It was going to be Mother of God. Is this the end of Rico? Because his Rico uh, was was his name. And instead, he had to say something else because he couldn't use the word God because the censors would oppose it. When they remade wow. Scarface without Pacino as Scarface and set it in, in uh, the word fuck was used or derivative of fuck was used 277 times. That's the yeah. way it was changed from the 1930s to present day. Remarkable. It's, yeah. I mean, Remarkable. It, but yeah. Next, so we, as I said, the most fun I ever had writing a book was working on, on that book with Glenn Mack now. Yeah. George, how much influence does the mob have over Hollywood? They used to have a lot. There's, you know, uh, back in the day, I think they had a lot in the very beginning. Um, Handsome Johnny Roselli. There's a, a biography oh, written God. A years ago. R really fascinating about how they got involved in the movie industry. They got involved with the unions out there. And they controlled an awful lot. And, and uh, that's why in The Godfather, when he goes Can after... Can I ask you a question ball. about the handsome Johnny Roselli? Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's always been this kind of, you know, this kind of um, uh, story in the, in, in the back room that he and J. Edgar Hoover were lovers. <laughs> now, I, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's been talked about a lot. Well, what, I mean, the, what's the deal there? I know that he was a degenerate gambler. I, we that's that's well known. Yeah, well, I mean, and I think what's also yeah. well known is that he did have, you know, He's a relationship dancing. with, you know, uh, Hoover in some regard. You know, were, was it sexual? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. No, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. But if you look at the whole history of Johnny Roselli and where he was and the things he did, I mean, he ended up his body in a drum floating in the, uh, the the bay off of, I think, Tampa, down in Florida. Roselli was supposedly heavily involved in the whole CIA plot in the Kennedy assassination. That's so we hear, yeah. So, I mean, this guy moved in a lot of different circles. I never heard him having any kind of sexual relationship with Hoover, but he certainly was, he got around a lot. He, he had a lot of, he was a ladies' man. He was out in Hollywood. He was in Vegas. Then he ended up in Florida, and he ended up dead. I mean, this is... Well, was, yeah, they actually... Uh, Oliver Stone actually uh, intimated that in his film JFK. Yeah. 
that there was some kind of and Dan, am I right? No, yeah, no, uh, it was obviously he was heavily played off as being homosexual, but it was yeah. it was hinted that he had uh, lovers within the U.S. government. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, and, and and that's that's where I'm basing the the info from. But Dan, I know that you had, you had questions. Go ahead, my friend. Well, we're gonna uh, to continue with the the uh, portrayal of of the mob and and organized crime in, in film. Something that that. Uh, Mr. Granahan mentioned that, that that got me thinking about that is you talked about the evolution with the Godfather and the other advancements of other film. And then obviously the Sopranos and right. movies like Goodfellas and Casino and, and things like that, that have kind of portrayed this, this, you know, a, not hero, but very likable character. Do you, do you think ha, has that had any real impact on actual organized crime? Like, are there, People in say their their teenagers and twenties who want to join the mob because they see they see the fiction and think you know damn I could do this or that that looks great let me let me try and and get in I, like have you seen something I wish like I that? I had asked that question. Damn I, it! I've had some I've, <laughs> I've had some some FBI and law enforcement guys say that second and third ge- generation Italian American kids who don't grow up in a in a in a ghetto Italian American community live in the suburbs. They see movies like The Godfather as a training film. Here's the way you're supposed to act. Here's the way you comport yourself. Here's the way you dress, kiss each other on the cheek, that kind of stuff. So in that respect, I think there has been some of that. And and the, the Al Pacino uh, Scarface movie has played really big in the drug underworld, young kids. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, hello to my little friend and all of that. You know, so yeah. I think... I think there is maybe and maybe it's we should say tragically there is there's this influence, a negative influence. These films kind of hold this this world up to be something that you want to emulate. I mean, if if you look at the reality, look at look at Philadelphia from Angelo Bruno to the present. Every mob boss is either dead or in jail. So why, why do you? Yeah. Want to be What's the point of that? Absolutely. So, well, you, you know, it, Joey Molino and he's and, and, I, and I like Joey, but. Joey's in his fifties, and I think he spent half of his adult life in prison. Well, you know, yeah. what's, what's the point? Well, you know, the, the, tying into what what Dan was talking about with the with film and television, there's another film that gets beat up a lot for being uh, inaccurate or uh, not quite on the money, and it's a a great written film with uh, Robert De Niro and Chaz Palminteri, uh, The Bronx Tale. Yeah. Bronx Tale is another one of those films that comes across as, you know, okay. being bashed for its uh, inauthenticity. No, right? never, and, and, and that you're shaking I, your head. <laughs> no, I, and it's funny you say that because I, I, I've never heard that in my life. That is actually the real story of Chaz Palminteri. That's yeah. his story. He had a, he had a one-man yeah. show in New York. Right. Exa- that's mood. exactly right. I'll open up the mood a little bit here. You mentioned the Bronx Tale. And there's an actress on that show that I know, uh, Catherine Narducci. We had her on my show. She plays mm-hmm. Robert De Niro's wife in that movie. Yeah. And I just saw a picture with Catherine and Robert yesterday, and she looks like his, more like his granddaughter now. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that, that is Chas Pound and Jerry's story, and it's... Yeah. I think I think it's a fairly accurate story of how he grew up on Belmont Avenue. You know, that's that's what that was about. And uh, yeah. and De Niro plays against type in that movie. De Niro's the bus driver, straight lace guy. And uh, yeah, and I, I like the funny the thing was, and it was written from Chaz Palminteri's viewpoint. Yeah, clearly it was something that he lived, but uh, yet, you know, somebody watching this film is going, you know, thinking to themselves, yeah, this is. Uh, not authentic. This is like hokey. You know, people don't talk Angel. like that. Well, I don't know. is it better to be loved or feared? It's feared because it lasts longer. You know, I mean, I never heard. Look that, at, Angelo, but I never heard that, Angelo. But kind it's of in the movie. But, it's but in the movie. What I want to touch on on a Bronx Tale. Bronx Tale is obviously a movie when Chaz was younger. It's a dated movie. But yeah. one thing that we can look at, kind of like a parallel. Between and I talked to you about this, Angela. When you're older and you're growing up in that kind of a neighborhood, Italian American neighborhood, you yeah. are idolizing gangsters, and that's the way it is in a lot of the African American communities today. Yeah, that, I mean, True. those are the guys with power and status. Those are the guys who get things done. And, yeah, yeah, and there's not much else there. So yeah, it, it's unfortunate, but Matt, I think you're right that that's the way it used to be in Italian 
ethnic communities and cities, and now it's the way it is in a lot of uh, African American communities. Unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, George, this is uh, this has been a fast uh, hour, and we only have an hour for our show, unfortunately. Can I bring you back? Can we do a part two with you? Oh, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Right? Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I'm talking to all you guys. I, I really appreciate you doing this. I'm, there's just so much to, to cover, and you just we just can't do it in an hour. But, Matthew, can you come back for part two and I bring George back? I would, I would love to. Thank you. Andy. Beautiful. Yeah. That's Dan, cool. I know you're coming back because you have to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get fired. Exactly, right? <laughs> George, thank you so much. Um, before I let you go, I um, just want to fill in everybody on what's coming up on Wrestling with the Future. And our uh, wrestling show is coming up. We've got, speaking of Italian-Americans, Dominic, we've got one of the most famous Italian-American wrestlers of all time who have stood side by side with the legendary Bruno San Martino for almost his entire career. The uh, iconic legendary Dominic DiNucci will be here September 15th. Uh, he will be here to discuss his uh, life and career and what he's doing now. We will have Kenny Casanova, a noted wrestling personality and author, written some 13 books on wrestling. We will also have, and I believe he's coming. I'll get my book in a second. Oh, here we go. Um, we also have Daniel next week. We have um, get my calendar uh, here. Oh, the return of Cowboy Scott Casey and his publisher. Um, another Italian boy, Nicholas Maschi. All these Italians are coming out of the friggin' woodwork. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's going to be a good one. And Dan the Beast Severn will be here on September seventeenth. Right. One of my best friends, Angelo. Yep, and you're going Dan to be here for that one too, Granimal. And a lot of people don't know that Dan and I have been doing stand-up comedy together for years. That's and, a and scary thought. <laughs> I, roast Dan. I had an opportunity to roast Dan last year, and uh, it was a good time. It, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, if, if, you, if you haven't seen that clip, go check it out. It's hilarious. <laughs> Matthew, thanks for joining us, brother. I'm going to let you go, and I'll touch base with you tomorrow. Thanks, bro. Thank you, Angela. Have a good day. You got it. George, <laughs> thanks for joining us uh, I'm going to bring it back in uh, two. Is it two weeks? Okay. Can yeah, I bring we'll it back in two weeks? Yeah, sure. That'd be good. That'd be fine. Beautiful. And I Thank to be you, George. Time. I promise to be on time next time. I'm sorry. Beautiful. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, George. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. Take care. Right. Good night, everybody. George Anastasia, everybody. All right, Dan. It's just you and me, kid. That was yes, a great sir. show. That was. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. I, I, I like when we... Uh, you know, we get rid of everybody. It's just you and me. Now we have a chance to talk because you and I don't really have a chance to talk a lot. You know, right? right. Well, you when know, people I mean, people you, think you, because you're my co-host that we talk all the time. So I I barely know this bastard. You, I see him once you, a week. You get going, <laughs> and nobody has a chance to talk. I see him when he feels like showing up. <laughs> <laughs> now, how you doing, man? You we went on vacation. So yes, where'd sir. you go? Uh, family and I went to the Smoky Mountains. Good for you. Good for you, Tennessee. Yes, sir. Good. What'd you do besides chase bears? Oh, uh, mo mo mostly just listening to the. Uh, we, we, you know, we it was with the with the virus. We stayed in a lot, so yeah. You know, it was just dinner and movies and the occasional walk well, out. Would you go to like Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge or place like you know? Yeah, like that? yeah, both. both. Okay. We, uh, well, there's we a, a lot to do there. Yeah, no, there is. We we had, like I said, it was a family thing. It was dinner and, you yeah. know, uh, brother's brother and, and respective wives went out and saw a couple of the museums. You know, and you saw a couple of hillbillies. Yeah. Good. You Sorry, saw the I'm, guy. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting glared off camera here. My, my wife didn't, uh, didn't, didn't. Hang in there, Mama. Up. We'll be with you in a minute. I must have left <laughs> something out of the story. Yeah, like the fact that it was fucking. Still recording. 
Did you meet the the guy who introduced you to his wife and sister, and there was one girl there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I love that one. That's funny. Dan, I will see you on Tuesday. I think is the next time you and I are together, and we're going to yes, have. Sir. We will have with, and I should remember because I just said it. Are you kidding me? Um, we are going to have Scott, uh, Scott Casey, and Nick Mashey. He's going to Scott's going to come back okay. and talk about his book, and uh, Nick, the guy that wrote the book for him. Sounds good. And then Ken Castanova is here on September 10th, and Dominic Danucci is here on the 15th. That's going to be a great show. I'm looking forward to that one. That's going to be a good one. Well, brother, you have a good one. I will. Uh, I'll see you next week, and uh, everybody will see you on Tuesday at our next show. Happy wrestling. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Good night.